Welcome back to Movies Outpost. Today we'll be diving into an action thriller film titled Plane. Enjoy the recap. The movie kicks off with our main man Brody Torrance dashing through the airport. He's running super late for his flight out of Singapore. As he's hurrying along, weaving between the crowds, his phone rings. It's his daughter, waiting for him in Hawaii. They've got New Year's Eve plans, and she's a bit anxious he might not make it in time. He tries to calm her down, promising he'll be there, hoping deep down there's no hitches in his day. Brody makes it to his plane just in time. Here, he meets his co-pilot Deli. They're getting to know each other when Deli points out some bad weather on their route. Before they can dig into that, in comes the flight officer, announcing that they're headed to Tokyo with just 14 passengers aboard. Brody, a bit concerned about the looming storm, suggests maybe they should take a different route. But the flight officer isn't having it, saying the storm might clear up, and the other way would take longer. Despite their reservations, Brody and Deli nod in agreement. Then, a friendly face, Bonnie, a flight attendant, steps into the cockpit. She tells Brody there's someone who needs to see him outside. He meets Officer Knight, who informs him that he will be escorting a prisoner on this flight, Louis Gaspare. Turns out Louis is on his way to face charges for homicide, and they caught him hiding out in Bali. Brody, always thinking of his passengers, asks the officer to keep the cuffed man out of sight to avoid any panic. Officer Knight nods in understanding and takes a seat at the back of the plane with the handcuffed Gaspare. Trying to put that out of his mind, Brody chats with two other flight attendants, Isabella and Maria. The team then gets busy, wishing all the passengers a happy new year as they board. We see a mix of folks, Sinclair, a businessman who's always on edge, and a couple who can't stop pointing out every little thing about the plane. Doing his best to reassure them, Brody assures the duo that the plane is in good shape. Then there's Katie and Bree, a social media star, who find out their seats are taken by Officer Knight and Gaspare. They're a little starstruck and pick a different spot. Not missing an opportunity, they try to snap a sneaky pick of Gaspare, but he's quick to shut that down. With everyone tucked in and buckled up, Brody gives a quick flight briefing over the intercom, even cracking a light-hearted airline joke, and they're off. At first, all is well. The flight crew is serving snacks, Brody and Deli are sharing family stories, and the vibe is relaxed. But as expected, they fly straight into the storm. Brody, ever the professional, quickly asks everyone to keep their seatbelts on, and tries to radio air traffic control, but there's just static. As they venture deeper into the storm, a massive lightning bolt hits the plane. It shakes everything, and the cabin turns chaotic. Brody leaves the cockpit to Deli and heads out to see a mess in the aisles. Bags, drinks, you name it. He gets to work helping the attendants clean up, reassuring passengers that it's just a bit of rough weather. Sinclair, ever the complainer, gives Brody a piece of his mind, but Brody doesn't bite. Instead, he firmly tells the crew to make sure everyone stays safely buckled in. Things take a turn for the worse when the plane gets hit again. Poor Brody stumbles and whacks his head, drawing blood. But being the dedicated pilot he is, he pulls himself together and hurries back to the cockpit. It's not a great scene. They're without power, communication is a no-go, and it seems like the skies have unleashed all its fury upon them. The grim reality hits. The plane's battery won't last much longer. With not many options left, they decide to land the plane, no matter where. Bonnie taking charge quickly fills everyone in on the situation, her voice firm, stay buckled in. Do not leave your seats. Brody and Deli, eyes glued to the instruments, are on the hunt for a safe place to touch down. Meanwhile, the crew is doing everything in their power to keep everyone calm and secure. Suddenly, Officer Knight's phone tumbles from his hand sliding across the floor. The crew shouts out warnings, fearing his reaction. But instead of heeding their advice, Knight reaches out to retrieve it. Isabella, seeing the danger but driven by her instinct to help, rushes towards him. But then tragedy strikes. Another jolt rocks the plane, throwing both of them, and their lives are cruelly snuffed out in an instant. Bonnie, her face white with shock, forcefully reminds everyone to stay put. And after what they've just seen, no one dares to budge. Back in the cockpit, the tension is palpable. They've spotted a potential landing spot. But time is ticking away, every second counts. The engines have mere minutes left. Brody and Deli give it their all, focusing on the task at hand. As the ground rushes towards them, Brody spots a road. With sheer determination, he maneuvers the plane, its wings brushing against treetops, cutting a path. Against all odds, Brody manages to land the plane safely. The moment the plane comes to a stop, a mix of shock and relief washes over everyone. They quickly deduce they might be on an island, possibly in the Philippines. Because the plane isn't fully stable, they decide to evacuate swiftly. Delhi leads the way, ensuring a smooth exit for the passengers. 
Bonnie, who's lingering to check on those who didn't make it, is urged by Brody to hurry up and get out. By daybreak, all survivors are safely outside grateful to be alive. Back at the airline's headquarters, the atmosphere is tense. The bigwigs are gathered, and word of Trailblazer 119's disappearance has reached the CEO. They bring in Scarsdale, an ex-Special Forces officer, to spearhead the rescue mission. He's quick to point fingers, especially when he finds out the flight officer didn't heed Brody's suggestion for an alternate route. The last known signal was traced to Manila, but it went dead shortly after. The room is filled with discussions, strategies, and possible ways to pinpoint the plane's location. Back on the island, Bonnie hands Brody a set of keys, there to Gaspar's handcuffs, found during the evacuation. As Brody and Deli pour over a map to figure out their exact location, they land on a troubling conclusion. They're on Jolo Island. Deli's face goes pale. He explains to Brody that this island isn't just any island, it's dominated by hostile militias known for their brutal ways. Brody, sensing the gravity of the situation, opts not to share this with the already shaken passengers. Instead, he tells them they're likely in the Philippines and that they'll be working on getting help. To keep spirits up, he assists in setting up tents and creating a temporary camp. Sinclair, never one to hold back his opinions, voices his disagreement about staying outside. He thinks the plane would be the best shelter. But Brody is quick to point out the risks, highlighting the lack of power and the stifling heat inside. The passengers rally behind Brody, expressing their gratitude for his quick thinking and advising Sinclair to do the same. Later, Brody and Deli make an attempt to restore power to the plane, but to no avail. Brody then shifts his focus to ensuring dignity for those who didn't survive, carefully wrapping their bodies. His attention is drawn to Gaspar though, and a peek into his bag yields a knife. Slipping into a fresh shirt Brody starts forming a plan. Deli, always prepared, gathers water supplies, their mission to find help, and he wants Gaspar to join him. After briefing the passengers about the situation and potential wait for rescue, Brody unlocks Gaspar's cuffs. Together they venture into the unknown. Meanwhile, in the bustling headquarters in New York, the search continues. Despite their best efforts, they're short on leads. With only a hunch that the plane might be in the Philippines, Scarsdale pulls every string he's got. In the end, it's decided to bring in the big guns. A mercenary black ops team is summoned for the rescue mission. As Brody and Gaspar journey deeper into the dense forest, Brody's suspicion is piqued. He asks him if he was ex-military or something and Gaspar tells him that he was part of the French Foreign Legion. However, the plot thickens when the chief of the local militia, Junmar, is introduced. He's just gotten word from a villager about the plane's unexpected landing. Upon learning of the plane's crash location near the mines, Junmar quickly deduces it isn't a military operation since he hadn't been tipped off by his spies. Simultaneously, after Gaspar's unexpected disappearance, Torrance stumbles upon an old warehouse. Using his knowledge, he manages to rig up a temporary communication device. He dials the airline's number, but they tell him they have been getting prank calls about the plane all day and end the call. Desperate, he calls his daughter Daniela, relaying the situation and emphasizing their location on Jolo Island. But danger is never far away. Torrance is ambushed from behind. The assailant is fierce, but Torrance, drawing upon his training and adrenaline, eventually overpowers him, but the silent struggle is soon overshadowed by the distant sound of gunfire. Bracing himself for another confrontation, Torrance is instead met by Gaspar, who re-emerges from the shadows, brandishing a rifle for Torrance. As they make their way together, the grim sight of several bodies hints at Gaspar's recent activity. Discovering a camera amongst the belongings, they view footage that reveals the dire fate of other foreigners who crossed paths with the local militia. Their dread intensifies as they approach the crash site in a van. The sounds of vehicles initially lift the passengers' spirits, but this fleeting hope is shattered by the unmistakable echo of gunshots. As the militia starts to gain control over the passengers, they demand to know Torrance's identity. As tension escalates, a young woman makes a desperate bid for freedom, resulting in her instant death. The harrowing scene continues as her distraught partner is also taken down. Witnessing the horror unfolding, Torrance's instinct is to intervene. But Gaspar, with a cautioning grip and a keen understanding of their tactical position, advises against revealing Torrance's identity as the plane's captain. Recognizing the heightened stakes, they both understand that a covert plan is their only chance to save the passengers from the grips of Junmar and his deadly militia. Junmar's henchmen, intent on squeezing every bit of value from the passengers, descend upon them, snatching valuables and any personal effects that can be sold. 
Amid the chaos, a golden opportunity presents itself to Gaspar and Torrance. They quickly incapacitate and capture one of the robbers, trying to extract any vital information. The thug reluctantly reveals that the passengers are being transported to Dandulit village, but refuses to divulge more. Resourceful as ever, Torrance revisits the plane, and using the map, pinpoints the exact location of the village. To aid any incoming rescue teams, he scribbles a message detailing their current predicament and the village's location, crediting Delhi's handy repairs to the plane's electrical system. Scarsdale and his team, acting on Daniela's intel, get satellite access on the Jolo cluster area, so the mercenary squad know where to parachute in. Tasking them with the rescue of the passengers and crew, their expertise and efficiency are unmatched, making them the best shot the passengers have. By the time Torrance and Gaspar infiltrate Dandulit village, the situation appears dire. However, their tactical approach and Gaspar's ruthless precision swiftly neutralize most threats. As they locate the passengers, their elation is tempered by the realization that the majority of the militia remain unaccounted for. Torrance, ever the hero, decides to create a diversion to allow the passengers a chance at escape. He confronts Junmar, feigning ignorance. The ruse, however, doesn't fully convince the shrewd Junmar, leading to a violent altercation. But before it escalates further, the skies are lit up as the Black Ops team commences their assault, swiftly dispatching most of Junmar's men. A reunited group, already loaded into a nearby bus with Torrance joining them shortly, make way for the plane. But they aren't out of the woods yet. Junmar, fueled by rage, rallies his remaining forces and orders an attack on the plane, believing it to be the group's escape route. As the bus speeds away, Torrance is informed of a bitter reality. A full-fledged rescue operation won't be initiated for another 24 hours, the stakes remain high, and the challenges ahead are daunting. Upon arriving at the aircraft, Torrance earnestly implores everyone to put their faith in him one final time. Convincing them that the plane is their sole avenue for escape, the group boards, Torrance then solicits additional time from the rescue team to make necessary adjustments. Just as he does so, Junmar makes a violent appearance, wounding a passenger during an ensuing gunfight. A sniper begins firing taking out Junmar's men as well as his cars, but they fire back and hit Torrance as he is trying to board the plane. In spite of a bullet wound in his leg, he dashes inside backed by the others, at headquarters, while Hampton rejects the idea of Torrance piloting the plane. Scarsdale gives his approval. Inside the aircraft, the pilots and crew get busy with pre-flight tasks. Outside, Shellback and Gaspar are still engaged in combat. Gaspar discovers a stash of cash belonging to the mercenaries and takes it for himself, abandoning the group. As they're about to depart, Junmar's forces make a final stand. They fire at the plane as well as the mercenaries. Shellback and his men retreat to the plane still providing cover fire. One of Junmar's henchmen aims an RPG at the plane, but Gaspar intervenes, eliminating the threat. Torrance watches as the missile misfires, momentarily feeling relief. This is short-lived, as Junmar readies another shot. Thinking he could halt the takeoff, Junmar parks his car in front of the aircraft. Undeterred, Torrance navigates the plane through the obstacle. Communicating with air traffic control via the rescue team, they identify a nearby landing strip within the plane's fuel range. Torrance pulls off a successful landing, greeted by relieved applause from the passengers, Everyone disembarks, recognizing Torrance as the man who guided them through peril to safety. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.